Uh, I'm still learning to get my timings right, so I am going to use a script today. I will try and be engaging, but I hope that's okay. Um, yes, uh, my name is Linnea Wollen. I am a lecturer in sociology and I'm a third year PhD candidate at Queen Margaret University in Edinburgh. And I was meant to be joined by my PhD supervisor, John Dr. Hughes today, but he can't make it, so it's just me in the end. Um, but uh, today we, I am going to be telling you about uncertainty as a critical engagement strategy in museums. And the findings that I'll share with you are based off a paper that John and I published earlier this year in the journal Global Perspectives. There was a special edition on, on uh, heritage and uncertainty. And uh, our specific paper focused on the use of uncertainty, both as a critical engagement strategy and as an effective strategy. Uh, I'm only going to be touching on the critical engagement stuff today, but if you're interested in seeing what we did on the, on the effective side of things. This QR code will take you directly to that paper, or if you want to read it, I'm also happy to send you a PDF if you email me later. Um, so, I'm also specifically going to focus on one uh, museum in this presentation, which is the Scottish Cranock Centre. And the Scottish Cranock Centre is a archeological Iron Age museum that's located in, like by Loch Tay in Kenmore in, the, in Scotland. And, uh, a Cranagh is an Iron Age kind of uh, lake dwelling that you can see up there in the top picture. Um, and uh, unfortunately, this Cranagh reconstruction that they had that was very much at the centre of the museum burnt down a couple of years ago. You may remember that from the news. So currently it looks like the bottom picture there, which is also what it looked like when I did my field work with the Cranagh Centre uh, a couple of years ago. They are moving site soon though, so they are doing a new reconstruction at the new site. So uh, they will be back again at the centre of that museum when they do move. But just for a bit of context as to why it's called that, that's why. Um, and the current site is made up of one indoor museum space. And uh, then there are, uh, and within that museum space, they tell the kind of broader story or the broader context of the Iron Age uh, and Iron Age life in, in Scotland. So that is quite a quote unquote traditional museum space, uh, if you will. But outside, there are also several different stations that tells visitors more about uh, everyday aspect of life in the Iron Age. So they have stations like technology and textiles and cooking and trade, for example, and a puppet show. Um, <laughs> and uh, in terms of the visitor experience and visitor engagement, uh, visitors are guided through the whole site by a tour guide. And at each of the stations, they encounter a member of staff or a volunteer or an apprentice. Uh, that are kind of loosely grouped together under this umbrella term of interpreter, an Iron Age interpreter, uh, that tell them about that particular area. So they encounter lots of different people during that time at the site, which is important to keep in mind for the rest of the presentation, that kind of direct face-to-face uh, -face contact with uh, museum practitioners and volunteers. Uh, however, they're not only told uh, about each particular area by the people who are staffing them, uh, and then kind of move on to the next one. It's more active engagement than that. And visitors, visitors are encouraged to reflect on and to kind of weigh in on and discuss different topics as they move through the site and through the different stations. Uh, specifically looking at how the Iron Age relates to the present day, but also what we could learn from the Iron Age and that we can apply um, in future. So, as I mentioned, uh, I am a PhD researcher, PhD candidate, and this project is part of my PhD. It's one of, one of three case studies that I'm doing. And the broader project focuses on the understanding, use and conceptualization of memory in museum community engagement activities uh, in Scotland. And I won't go into any of the memory stuff today, but I'm very happy to talk about that at another point if anyone's uh, interested. But uh, yes, this is just the one, my first biggest case study. And uh, the data were generated in the summer of 2021, so almost two years ago at this point, uh, and through 25 semi-structured interviews. And I interviewed uh, paid members of staff, apprentices, who are people who are there to gain a Scottish vocational qualification. So they do work for the museum whilst doing that in different areas like marketing and uh, visitor engagement and so on. Uh, I also interviewed volunteers and placement students from the University of Edinburgh who was there at the time. So quite a range of people and quite a range of experience as well. Some of them had been there for years. Some of them had literally arrived the day before I interviewed them. So a lot of different uh, perspectives. 
And I was at the Cranach Center for one week. And during that week, I also did some participant observations, specifically looking at uh, how the Cranach Center team interacted with one another, as well as how they interacted with visitors. And there is one more important thing to keep in mind that I didn't put on this slide, and that is that I did not speak to visitors during this, uh, in this research. So everything I will be sharing in this presentation is not from a visitor perspective, it's what the practitioners themselves kind of aimed or hoped to do through that practice. Uh, so just to, to keep that in mind. And in conceptualizing what it is, what a critical engagement uh, approach is, we specifically drew on Paulo Freire's dialogical approach that highlights the distinction between active and passive roles in knowledge uh, generation. And uh, in his case, he focused specifically on the role between teacher and student. In this case, it's more about the kind of expert interpreter uh, and the visitor in developing critical consciousness. And in this case, we did not really frame critical consciousness around necessarily changing something very concrete for the visitors, uh, but it was more about uh, an appreciation of how the Iron Age can, make, can be made sense of kind of through the prism of the Iron Age and through the prism of personal experience and to make links between different times. So how we can use that in critical uh, ways. So criticality in this sense was based on questioning established narratives, so not just accepting information that you are being presented with when you're at a museum, uh, but to consider the relationship between the individual and their social, their cultural and their historical contexts, and in embracing uncertainty as a way of, of doing that. And what this actually looked like in practice is what I'm going to focus on for the rest of the presentation. So the, uh, the Scottish Cranach Centre is an Iron Age museum, and so it deals with prehistory. And dealing with prehistory always involved dealing with uncertainty in one way or another. And uh, there are relatively few established facts about the lives of the Iron Age dwellers from this time uh, that we can make some kind of uh, interpretations of the evidence that we have from the objects that have been excavated from the bottom of the loch, which is where the museum is situated. But most things we cannot know with 100% certainty. So for that reason, the Cranach Centre team felt that it's important to make clear to visitors what the truth is. So it was a huge emphasis on truth and in not intentionally sharing false information. And uh, I mean, that maybe isn't that surprising. It's like, oh, they don't lie. But what is interesting about that is that they all also emphasise that it's important to make all their interactions uh, with visitors engaging. So not just to share the facts that they have, but to tell a story, to create a narrative. And in doing that, they have to make consistent distinctions between what is fact, what we can know for certain, what is interpretation, and what is imagination, and to make sure that the visitors know what the distinction is throughout their visit. So, here are some examples of how they managed to do that in practice during the tours. Uh, broadly, their approaches fell under three different uh, categories. So when talking about things that they knew for certain, they would say things like, we know this because we can see that from the tool marks here. And often then they would kind of point to the evidence and show it to the visitors, or they would sometimes show, show them it and then go, why do you think we could, uh, why do you think we know that based on, on this object? Uh, and one example when they did that was when talking about uh, grinding flour on a grindstone. So they have the grindstone there and they have the remnants of the flour. So we know that that is what it was uh, used for. Secondly, is to convey things that are likely. And they would say things like, it is likely that they would have done it this way. There are some clues that would suggest that, but we are not 100% uh, certain. And again, that then involved showing the clues uh, to the visitors. Uh, and for example, they have small patches of, uh, of fabric in the textile area, and they spoke about dyes, and that it's likely that it would have been this color or that color that would have been made from this plant or that plant. And that is likely because those plants are native to the area, but we can actually see the color of the fabric. So to say like, oh, this, this was a purple fabric, when we don't know that for certain would be misleading. So to in incorporate a little bit of, uh, of uncertainty um, when talking about things like that. And then thirdly is when talking about things that they do not and cannot know. And they would say things like, we cannot know exactly what it would have sounded like, but it may have sounded something like this. 
Uh, and this example specifically came up during the tour when uh, one of the members of the Kranich Center team were playing a uh, song on a reconstruction of, a, of an instrument that looks very similar to a lute. Uh, and of course, we don't know what kind of songs they would have played or if that's exactly what the instrument would have looked like or if that's what it would have sounded like. But it did kind of uh, create the sense of connection to the Iron Age and it very much set the scene for the visit. It made it more memorable, memory. Um, so they would uh, incorporate uh, things that they do not know in that way. And then lastly, they would say things like, I like to imagine they would have done it for this reason. What do you think? And then in this example, they often use the word imagine when they were theorizing about people's intentions for doing things. And uh, I had a lot of really interesting uh, theories based on visitors' kind of personal experiences uh, and the knowledge of other periods of history, for example, uh, or just common sense, because this is what people probably would have done because we're all people and we're not actually that different despite there being two and a half thousand years in between us, for example. And this quote here, uh, from Jenny also illustrates this reasoning behind incorporating an element of uncertainty quite well, I think. So Jenny is a staff interpreter, focuses specifically on, on textiles. And she says that when I'm doing the tours, I sort of speculate, you know, this could have been, which adds an air of mystery. So you're not saying black and white, but what you're doing is opening people's minds and getting them to start thinking, ah, oh, well, maybe. And once you start thinking for yourself about things, I think it makes it more interesting for them. That's the visitors. And I think it adds an element of mystery, which most people love without realizing it. So uncertainty in, in this sense is useful in opening up conversations about possibilities and in considering, the, when considering these what ifs uh, provides the opportunity for visitors to think more independently, potentially, and to listen to other people's ideas of how things and different times interlink with one another, as well as uh, how they differ. What is also important to keep in mind is that the Kranich Center's core focus is on the everyday life of the Kranich dwellers in the Iron Age. That's not to say that they don't focus on the broader picture. They do. They do it throughout the tours, and they also especially do that in the museum, where you, which is the first uh, bit that you enter. Um, but uh, most of it actually focuses on creating a sense of connection to their time and to do that by emphasizing shared experiences and similarities as well as differences between now and the Iron Age. Uh, and this also kind of uh, aims to demystify the notion that the Kranich Center team often experience the visitors come into the museum with, which is that this time is completely separate and incomprehensible from our kind of present day perspective. We are very, very different people. It was ages ago, I cannot relate to the Iron Age and the Iron Age people. Uh, and they said that by focusing on the everyday, they hoped and were aimed to, to challenge this perception that we are very different. And uh, so to give you another example of what creating this sort of connection uh, could look like in practice, uh, they spoke about textiles and raising points about sustainability and environmental impact, environmental problems, for example, uh, related to the uh, textile industry today. So thinking about things like fast fashion and so on. And not only did that allow for a conversation about the differences between the then and now, but also about how rapidly society has changed and how it's developed in the past few decades, how different these industries look like across the world and the cooperation that was required for Iron Age people to produce fabrics of the sort that they did. So even if we don't know many of these things for certain, it can still be used as a kind of a starting point to have bigger conversations. And uh, I also observe similar conversations in relation to seasonal eating, for example, and food waste, kind of food sustainability in the cooking area. They also had really interesting discussion about traditional gender roles as part of the cooking area. Um, so what they did in the tours to varying extents and using different types of techniques, really, uh, was questioning how the very distant uh, past can be understood in the present, but also consider how we can actually learn from the Iron Age. So what, what did they do that might be able uh, to help us kind of make sense of what we could do in, in future? And that focus on the small and being encouraged to reflect on how we are part, we are all kind of part of history, uh, also help to create that sense of connection and in seeing history as a narrative in the making rather than something that is static and just past and that is no longer relevant uh, to us. And all of that was also done with the hope that it would make Mr. visitors more curious to, to find out more when they did leave the museum afterwards. 
So the final illustration of criticality uh, in that practice that I'll give you is about starting conversations about the bigger picture um, and how we perceive, uh, perceive history. And this is a quote from Rich, who is a community archaeologist at the Kranick Center, and he talks about what he likes to do or speak about with visitors during the tours. And he says that, if you walk into the museum and you get greeted with a timeline that goes Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, and once you get talking about the textile, for example, there is this idea of actually, if a different group of people had stepped into archaeology, we, we, we would be talking about the Twill Age and the Tabby Age, or about dye colors, you know, the Green Age, the Purple Age, all those colors that were discovered. So we use Stone Age, Bronze Age and Iron Age because for the people that studied archaeology, tools uh, and the buildings were the most important things. But actually, if you go back in time, it's not just the iron, it's the way that they wove, it's the wood that they used, it's the buildings they lived in, it's making the small, we consider these things small, but they are just as significant, and two and a half thousand years ago, those might have been the most important things. And in this sense, then, critical reflection is both enacted on a kind of current issues level, as well as on a broader historical level that kind of highlights the possibilities that uncertainty and kind of shaking the narrative, uh, if you will, can offer in the sense that it, uh, that it can kind of switch things up. We don't think about things in the same way and we can start these kinds of conversations uh, in an Iron Age museum. And so not only does the Kranich Center team acknowledge uncertainty as, a, as an engagement strategy uh, to deal with a lack of certainties in the knowledge that they have about the Iron Age Kranich dwellers, they also use it as a starting point for conversations about bigger topics, but that are framed in a smaller and uh, everyday context. And what's also important to mention is how dealing with uncertainty, and particularly in being honest about knowing, not knowing things, um, or not kind of not having the whole story or guessing sometimes, or asking what you think, uh, reflecting it back to the visitors, was something that was very positive in terms of breaking down this, uh, from my observations, uh, interpreters and visitor power divide that often arises during museum tours where one just listen to the others. Um, that's not, again, to say that the Iron Age interpreters don't know more about the Iron Age and about the objects that they are talking about. Most of the time, they definitely do know more than the visitors. But kind of opening, up, opening it up and acknowledging when they do not know things uh, made the visitors, again, from my observations, more confident in joining in the conversation and in sharing their own ideas rather than just listening and taking in the information and not questioning it. Uh, so that relationship uh, enabled them to be more reflective and critical during their tour. So to wrap up, I want to emphasize that the use of everyday stories can make, distant, can make the distant past more relatable uh, and that having that direct and open interaction with visitors provides this opportunity to consider how the past relates to now and how it relates to us as individuals in this time. And uh, this is just a very kind of initial work on uncertainty. This is not at all extent, uh, kind of exhaustive, and you can take this a lot further. You can make it more critical, as uh, Pink and Akama says, for example, acknowledging uncertainty entails a critique. It is anti-institutional, it's radical and risky. So you can take it much further than we have currently done, but it's a starting point uh, for something. And uh, it is about encouraging visitors to consider things at a deeper level, at a more reflective level. And what is crucial to this in the case of the Kranach Center is this direct interaction between visitors and uh, staff members when they are at the site. They are not walking around just reading, they are there talking to people uh, throughout, and several different people as well, may I add. Uh, so museum practitioners are expert storytellers, but incorporating uncertainty within the narratives and in their practice exposes room for visitors to reimagine, to maybe reposition and reformulate knowledge in novel and potentially challenging ways that can function as this kind of uh, critique that Pink and Akama uh, draws attention to. So when considering the accounts and experiences that I encountered during my time at the Kranich Center, I would argue that uncertainty must not only be acknowledged and considered and reckoned with, but also that it can actually be practically useful when asking questions about how prehistoric and present day lives are interconnected. And uh, 
many might think like, oh, but we already do this. This is just what museum practitioners do. Uh, and that's kind of exactly my point. Uh, and it's for that reason that I think it's necessary to recognize and to reward this type of practice and to perceive it as deliberate and skilled labor. It's not just something that happens. There is skill that's involved behind it and there is thinking behind it, for example. And, uh, and uh, it deserves uh, acknowledgement as a practice uh, in its own right. That's it. <laughs>